Here you go. Well, welcome to the April 19th, 2022 session of Tangerine SDR and HamSci Technical Session. My name is Dave, KV0S, and this week I've been uh, working on several projects here in the shack. Um, I did install a um, APRS I gate on a Pi today to see how it works. So I'm testing it out and uh, I, it seems to work. A few quirky things happened, uh, but I'm, st I'm still working on it. Anyway, that's it for me. Um, next on the list is Nathaniel. Uh, w2 NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Thanks, Dave. Well, most of the weekend was doing Easter sorts of things, uh, which went very nicely. Um, but I've also been working on uh, getting logistics set for the Dayton trip, you know, continuing to work on uh, paperwork, wrapping up the uh, HAMSI workshop, uh, trying to plan for uh, future projects, like trying to get the uh, plans for the eclipse off the ground. Um, I'm also uh, working on hiring a couple new graduate students and um, making sure uh, we're ready for the CEDAR conference as well. So there's just a lot of stuff going on. Uh, I'm going to be trying to use the uh, new uh, Python-based version of Farlap uh, to make a figure for uh, one of Christina's papers. So I'll be trying to do that this week. So just all, all sorts of things like that. W2NF, back to net. Well, very good. Next on the list, we have Bill in 8ET. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, yeah, like I was saying, I got the uh, there it is, most of it. So, uh, the grape, it's all running, and uh, that's the power supply to it right there, and I'm a little concerned about that running out. <laughs> I'm not sure how long it will last, <laughs> but I got it running for a while and uh, got to get a better power supply for the whole setup to uh, run it. But I don't know that the uh, nine volt battery will last more than 24 hours, but it should at least get me through one cycle to make sure it's all working. I know it's generating a great big spreadsheet with a header and uh, hopefully it'll get sent off the right place when it does all that. So that's the main thing. Uh, we spent the Easter weekend doing Easter things. That was about it. So back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. Next on the list is Mike, AA8K. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, thank you, Dave. Greetings to everyone and listening and uh, have a great, great evening. <laughs> back okay. to you, Dave. Uh, okay, next on the list, we have Andy, N8LWF. Go ahead, Andy. Hi guys, I don't have much to report. I accept that I'm very happy to have a tiny little purple PCB in my hands from OSH Park. The uh, N8 OBJ, it says WWV receiver on it. That's about all I got. And I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> very good. And let's see, next on the list, we have Bill. Uh, AB4, EJ, go ahead. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good evening. Uh, well, let's see. I made reservations to go to the CCMC uh, conference in Washington um, in first part of June, uh, rather, and um, and uh, spend some uh, spend some time working with the NASA people, and um, then. Um, I, uh, I worked a little bit more on the on the getting the central host system working on a under Apache. I have that running on a virtual machine on my home system, uh, so I know, I know I've learned what what does and doesn't work. And um, I'm going to have a meeting with the student team tomorrow to try and finish up their work uh, by the end of this month, so that uh, they can. Um, they can go for their summer vacation and they, they, I say vacation, but these students, 
they don't take a vacation in the summer, they work. <laughs> so, but, um, oh, and uh, I assembled a, uh, this evening assembled a 17 element two meter beam. I'm gonna see if I can do a little contesting on two meters. I, I've had pretty good luck contesting the VHF contest each year with six meters. So we're gonna try it a little bit with two meters. Um, I think I may need a little bit more power than what I have. I, you know, I just have 50 watts. So I think I, at some point I need to get one of those 150 watt transverters. But anyway, back back to that. That's all I had. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Jim K4BSE. Good evening, all. Well, not a whole lot here. Uh, had to uh, get my taxes done at the last minute and um, get that in, and that's all done now. Thank goodness and uh, Easter over the weekend. So not a whole lot going on. I have uh, been continuing to uh, watch the uh, grape uh, uh, data every day. And uh, it's uh, been surprising to me how much more ionospheric activity we're getting than we were getting for a while, presumably because the solar cycle is going up. I have noticed one curious thing that uh, I'm not sure what to do with yet. And that is that um, I seem to be getting a lot of TIDs and uh, other ionospheric disturbances at night when the um, um, ionosphere is away from the sun, shielded from the sun. So it's not clear to me uh, whether that's uh, caused by something that it uh, collected from the sun during the day before or whether it's uh, something strange that I don't understand. Anyway, that's about it. Uh, back to Ned. Well, fine business. I think I have one comment on that. Uh -huh. um, I think what we've been seeing um, is that looking when uh, working with Steve Serwin, we've seen that uh, when the signals are being refracted off of the E layer, they tend to be very stable. And when they're refracted off of the F layer, there's a lot more variability. And so what I think might be happening is that on, during the day, you're more often refracting off of the E layer, which is much more stable. And at night where the E layer, uh, you know, recombines a lot and becomes much less present, um, you're getting signals coming off of the F layer, which is much more variable. And you're seeing a lot more of these traveling atmospheric disturbances. That's a good point. That may well be what's happening. Oh, okay. Let's uh, go on. Next is Dan in for XWD. E. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Okay, thanks, Dave, and hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> they go on the last few days, was uh, up in the Washington, D.C. area doing some visiting and uh, just got back. So not much has happened. Um, I guess that's about it from here. Back to you, Dave. Okay. Uh, next on the list is Dave, KD0, EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Up. Oh, no, your, no voice, but uh, your mic mute is gone. We'll come back to Dave, he can fiddle with that. Anyway, next on the list, we have David, N1HAC. Go ahead, David. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, first, to comment on the TIDs, of course there are TIDs at night. That's what we're studying with our AM Doppler project. We only take data at night. And uh, yeah, it's coming off of the F layer and uh, the various effects that can, uh, that it can show. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting, we're in an interesting period. We're trying to get a radio um, put together uh, to send up to Baffin Island. We're having trouble getting the Raspberry Pi to behave, uh, running a RSP duo on a Pi and it keeps killing the uh, USB interface. Just <laughs> All, all the USB devices disappear. 
And we don't really know if it's the radio or the hard drives. We've got three um, SSDs on it that draw large amounts of current at times and um, can't figure out what's killing it. And we're supposed to take that, um, basically send it off shortly. Um, and likewise, even more so, we're trying to see if we can get a USRP to work on the Pi. We get about a fraction of a second of data and then it dies. So we're not in a good space right now, radio wise. Um, would that we had a tangerine that was all debugged and ready to go. <laughs> David, can you remove most of that stuff and try an RTL SDR and see if it uh, runs correctly for a while? Um, well, I guess I would say yes, the RTL SDR works fine because that's what we use for our EM Doppler receiver. And we've been running those for a couple of years and don't have this problem. Yeah, I would think that would be less spiky in its current draw. Right. Um, well, of course, it, it has a, an SSD on it as well. So, but it's not drawing as much current. Um, but that is an interesting question. If we just try running the same software running over uh, RTL SDR, we want the bandwidth of the, um, of the RSP Duo. Uh, we'd like to get five megahertz rather than one megahertz band, but uh, yeah, there, there is a difference in how they behave. So do you have any thoughts on that? Why the? Yeah, I, I have a, um, a mini B205, which is USB 3 powered mm -hmm. and can achieve the sample rates. Uh, it runs successfully on the laptop. I've not tried it on a Pi. Yeah. But it's a device fast enough and power hungry enough uh, that it might it might help you uh, narrow down your problem. Right. Okay. Well, we'll we'll keep working on it. Um, well, I have a comment. Uh, I've been using this little. Let me see that <laughs> SSD with my Raspberry Pi, and it works for a while, and then it just the whole system just goes down. Mm -hmm. And if I run it without the SSD, I have no issues. But literally, the SSD and a Logitech uning, unifying dongle cannot coexist on the Raspberry Pi USB bus. So I'm not it? sure what the solution is. Yeah, well, one thing about the SSDs, we're using the uh, Micron ones that uh, they normally are, you know, under most circumstances, they're good citizens, but then they have one and a half amp spikes, which is above what uh, USB necessarily is uh, yeah. spec to do. So we have them externally powered, but still um, something's taking down the USB. Um, I've tried it with um... hub. I, I've tried it with external power. It doesn't seem to help my situation very much. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for the help. Well, yeah, thoughts. Well, Maybe. we'll continue down the list. Okay. Thank you. Back to net. Next is Dave, uh, K E A Q E P. Go ahead, David. Uh, well, uh, well, good to see everyone tonight. I, I've been a little bit slacking on my HamSci work. Uh, I have been trying to upload my grape logs to the server, and I ran into some issues there. My dogs are having a wrestling match under the table, so there's some noise there. Um, but I, I may have to contact Jim or John about uh, what's going on with the grape data. Um, and as far as the magnetometer goes, I've been trying to get estimates for, because it got flooded, trying to get some estimates for some water remediation in the backyard. And uh, that has been difficult. Um, I, I haven't gotten many callbacks um, regarding that. Uh, so they seem to be very busy, but I do have it on good authority that um, even those who arrange and design shrubberies are under considerable economic stress. So the supply chain is, is clearly spotty. 
Um, and, uh, but we just have to work around these things. Uh, but I, I, I have an op optimistic outlook. KQEP, uh, back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. Uh, next on the list is Gary, AF8A. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, was fooling around over the weekend, number one, uh, on 20 meters a lot, trying to, trying to enjoy the, uh, the uptick in cycle 25 and the CMEs and the flares. And in fact, we got a radio blackout, you know, one hour or even a few hours later, we've got worldwide propagation back again. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, also been trying to, uh, I think with some reasonable amount of success, uh, record some data for the uh, WWV Sunrise Festival coming up at the end of the month and in early May uh, with the characterization signal that uh, they're transmitting for us at eight minutes past the hour. So I've uh, been um, trying to get my setup to work. I think I've got it working. I've sent some data over to Christina and uh, we'll see on Thursday if, uh, if I've had how much success I've had or if she's uh, still modifying her code. So that's about it. Back to that. Okay. Uh, next on the list is James, KG4, DSG. Go ahead, James. Yep. A little there slow, on, slow on the camera here. I had to switch monitors. Uh, not much to report here. It's just April 18th, and I'm just about to send the forms in. Uh, <laughs> wasn't a good year. So back to that. Well. Uh, sorry for that, but hang in there. Uh, next on the list, we have Joe, K7LUX. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, W7LUX. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, been uh, trying to uh, do some uh, direction finding. There's a, a mysterious carrier, been on uh, 40 meters CW7033 uh, uh, for three weeks plus now, and no ID, no modulation, just a steady carrier and not having a whole lot of luck doing that. Grape is working fine. I've got a couple of questions for Nathaniel, if you got just a minute. Uh, Nathaniel, uh, you mentioned uh, FARLAP. Is that the program you use to uh, determine uh, height of ionosphere, the uh, number of bounces and, and stuff like that? That's right, yeah, it's a ray tracing code. Okay, uh, does it work only with uh, MATLAB? Um, <clears throat> We, my graduate student, Alex Calderon, just came out with a version that will run in Python instead of MATLAB. Oh. However, yes. However, it's not quite ready for prime release yet. Um, so uh, we're going to take, we're going to have some beta testers work on it. But I can tell you, like this afternoon, I tried installing it on my own machine. I'm running into some installation issues, but I'm going to be trying to use it myself for, um, generating a, a figure for Christina's paper this week. But well, if, you, if you need another tester, I'd sure like to uh, get involved in uh, working with it. OK, uh, yeah, we'd love to have you. Um, so uh, we can have you work with, um, uh, I think Bill Lyles is heading up the beta testing program. OK, uh, thank you. You're welcome. And Nathaniel, don't forget to tell him about the recording from the uh, conference has a good presentation on that. Yes, uh, that's right. The um, Alex gave a nice, both Alex and Manny Cervera, Manny wrote the original FARLAP code. Uh, they both gave nice presentations at the HAMSI workshop. And I think what I'm going to do is I know that um, Jason Johnston doesn't have the uh, final versions uh, done yet, but what I think I'll, I will do within this week is uh, post the raw links to the raw footage on the HAMSI workshop agenda page. So anyone who wants to be able to rewatch the uh, presentations uh, can do so even uh, before Jason's edited versions come out. Thank you, Nathaniel. You're welcome. Okay, next on the list is John N8OBJ. It's been a while, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, Let's see, I've got the second generation of the sequencer into the board house. In fact, they just submitted the panel to fabrication this afternoon. <clears throat> that should take about two weeks to get back. Um, <clears throat> the other problem I ran into is I applied to a place that Dan Nathaniel gave out for the uh, coats. I think it was All Hearts. Yeah. 
and I wrote him a nice email saying, you know, that they, they printed the code number for, instead of ham side, they printed the code number for it on my jacket. And they basically said, well, we reviewed your order and you obviously screwed up. So basically F off. And they basically told me to go to hell. <laughs> they were not going to do anything about it. That's not very all heart like. No, I uh, sent them a message back saying you'll have to tonight. If you don't get back to me, I'm going to report it to the group. I would suggest that we find some other place to go to. And I'm also going to take the time tomorrow to go through the university purchasing office and have them blacklisted at case. So, yeah. <sighs> okay, well, I do- Fortunately, I have a access a think box to a, an embroidery machine. So I'm gonna unstitch it by hand and try and restitch it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah, I, I do appreciate your, um, how should I say this? I, I do appreciate the troubles that you're going through, but if we just, outright blacklist them it took me a while to get that all set up to get them to accept the logo yeah. and well, get that case, all... isn't, case will not be buying anything from them anytime in yeah. the near future now with with that <laughs> said if you are able to get a better uh distributor that yeah. you think works better i will be happy to adopt them i'm so. quite pleased with the jacket itself i mean yeah. it fits fine it's it's quality jacket but their their pr or their tech support is horrible yeah yeah and i basically showed their true colors and they're all you know, out i mean for them to take it back and redo it would have cost them maybe 10 bucks right and they basically said too bad you're stuck with it so yeah i'm not not impressed no i'm still a little pissed so that's probably you have to take that with a grain of salt <laughs> sounds good <laughs> i i got that set up about what three I guess four years ago, I got it set up. And um, so we just kind of kept using the same information since then. Yeah. So I don't, well, I, I don't I know. Was, if I, I wasn't too impressed with them either because the, 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 uh, the lab coat that I ordered is I ordered a large and it's, and I'm not a big guy and it's so tight, I can barely wear it. So yeah, it, yeah I know I take a 40 and I ordered a 44. And it just fits. Yeah, the size is built on. <laughs> so I'm not that big, but it, yeah, you got to order really big. I took Bill's advice and ordered something much larger. So mm -hmm. I am not impressed with them. If if people have um, suggestions for alternative distributors, I will be happy to take them. Actually, I'll ask our and, people at the. Uh, yeah. Um, and I'll be I'll also case. be happy to provide you the logo file if you want to. Brian. If you could email it to me, that would be great. Yeah, if not, I'll, I'll be come happy. up with something else. I, it just has to say ham site, but I'll have to yeah. unstitch the whole thing by hand. So that's going to yeah. take some time. Uh, I'll be I'll be happy to send you the logo file. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Right. John? Yeah. If you get really stuck, I, I'm local and I actually am a semi-capable sewer. Okay. Uh, and so I could embroider your name. Now, it might look a little... Uh, Charlie Brown Christmas like, but uh, you might actually they got my name and my call sign right, but they printed out the SPDF whatever code that was supposed to be the Hamsai logo on top. Well, do you have one of those little um, stitch removers? I think my wife does. So okay. yeah, I'll probably use that. But we have an embroidery machine at Thinkbox at Case, so I'll probably use that come up with something fancy or use the file that Nathaniel sends me. But anyway, uh, the other thing is I just continue finishing up my uh, report here. I gave the first logic board to Bob Benedict last week. We got the GPS U-blocks you feed are running. We were able to finally talk to it. Um, and then he proceeded to blow up the switching regulator. So now he's dead in the water. So he's hopefully coming over tomorrow night. I'll see how bad he burned the board. But <laughs> once two step forward, one step back. <laughs> anyway, back to that. Okay. Well, next on the list is Jonathan KC3EY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, a. a um... Uh, uh, it was it was a pretty busy week for me. 
Um, so I was going through the the uh, uh, wonderful uh, and exciting Dawn Course event that was captured uh, uh, early morning, um, April 10th. Um, and what I was able to do was uh, create, uh, so I, I, uh, I, um, I picked out the uh, time period that had the uh, uh, most intense chorus. And what I did was I, um, I um, um, created an audio file and I produced spectrograms um, of that file every 10 seconds. Um, so I created about, uh, I, I um, made about 60 spectrograms from the uh, data and it shows the, uh, um, uh, it, it shows the uh, uh, beautiful risers. Uh, so, so what I did then was I used FFmpeg and I input those spectrogram stills um, as well as the audio file and I was able to make a, a really cool movie. So what it'll do is um, it'll display the spectrogram for uh, uh, 10 seconds, and then it will go on to the next one for the next um, block of 10 seconds. So it actually works extremely well. I uh, requested the help of um, someone in the uh, FFmpeg um, IRC channel, they were very helpful in, uh, um, you know, figuring out the, the right way, way to do it and making a movie that was actually compatible with um, a lot of players, Facebook, YouTube, you know, things like that. So um, it actually looks really nice. I also worked with Paul to do some filtering, uh, 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 some more filtering on the event and uh, what I was able to do um, was um, um, I was able to uh, well uh, Paul came up with um, a uh, um, Paul came up with a um, a uh, band stop filter at the bottom of the band to uh, get rid of those, those um, loud uh, uh, spherics um, or the loud portion of the spheric when it would modulate the um, hum, hum filter. Um, a uh, a uh, three pole um, low pass filter and a three pole high, high, high pass filter. Um, and he also uh, what he did, he used his spheric blanker as well. So it actually took out the uh, uh, spherics and it actually sounds, sounds uh, pretty good. You could tell it's filtered, but you could hear, hear the chorus much better. And then uh, what he did was he, he uh, used his filter settings and he fed that into the event detector and he found that it detected um, um, at least um, uh, 16 more events uh, than, uh, than the original five. Uh, so the uh, filtering works a lot better with the event detector. Um, so I was, I was in, in the process of applying that to um, my event detector. Um, also, I um, I received an email from um, the editor of the Inspire Journal. Uh, some of you might remember uh, NASA Inspire. Um, that was the uh, project where they they uh, um, produced um, VLF receiver kits for students and hobbyists, and uh, um, a lot of academia uses those uh, kits for their projects and I was uh, um, I was asked to write an article uh, for the Inspire journal um, so I'm, I'm going to write an article about the uh, uh, system and the events that I captured um, and also a, a, a another another really uh, cool thing is that I um, um, 
I actually captured a couple whistlers. They were very weak, so the event detector didn't didn't find them, but they had a footprint that uh, reached all the way down to Forest, Virginia, where there was another receiver. So it was nice to actually uh, capture a um, couple of whistlers. Um, and lastly, there was some really nice amateur activity, a uh, really um, a, a strong transmission from an earth probe antenna uh, or an earth loop as it's called. Uh, so I, I'm gonna try to see if, um, it was received uh, at, at my receiver. Uh, that's all I have, back to the net. Okay, uh, next on the list, we have Jules, K2, KDJ. Go ahead, Jules. Good evening, Ned. Uh, I missed it last week, uh, but the last couple of weeks have been fairly quiet, at least as far as ham's eye activities go. Uh, I was able to collect some data for my AD-160 Invis experiment through the uh, a couple of CMEs we had back at the uh, beginning of the month, end of uh, March. I have to <clears throat> analyze that data uh, next to see what the effect was. Um, I have my uh, constant temperature chamber, chamber running uh, stably. So uh, probably the next step is gonna be to put an RM3100 in there and let it run above ground for a few months and check that out. Other than that, uh, not much more to report here. Go ahead. Well, fine business. And next on the list, we have Michael, A AC0G. Go ahead, Michael. Good evening, everybody. I've been uh, continuing to get better from COVID. So that's the good news. The um, been using the downtime to get try to wrap my head around GNU radio. Um, I actually ordered one of those Inspire receivers um, that Jonathan was just talking about and, and built it a couple of days ago as well, but it's um, misbehaving, so I have to try to track that down. Um, I'm using a Raspberry Pi and an RX, RSP Duo as well, but for a kind of grape type setup, it's gathering data. Um, which uh, seems to be pretty stable, but I do not have an external SSD plugged into it. So I can't be a control for that. The, um, <clears throat> uh, that's about it from here. Hope everybody okay. is well. Okay, next on the list, we have Noel WB0VGI. Go ahead, Noel. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Working with Jules. Uh, trying to work on uh, stabilizing the temperatures. My uh, magnetometers are all buried in iced ground still, so we're waiting for the ground to thaw. Uh, we we still have below zero or below freezing every every morning. So, um, other than that, uh, doing Easter things and getting uh, getting ready to uh, have have some warm weather. Take care, everybody. Very good. Uh, next on the list is Scotty, uh, Katie Zero, or Katie. <laughs> Go ahead, Scotty. <laughs> WA2DFI, how's that? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I've been pretty busy week um, this week. Now, let's see, I want to try and, uh, hold on a second, I want to do something here with the video because I want to show you a couple things. Um, anyway, uh, the completed the, um, uh, um, 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 what do you call it? The data ad engine adapter and uh, just got the final routes and everything today. It's, it's now in for quote on, uh, on building it. So um, <clears throat> anyway, I've, Dave, you're, where, where's the menu for turning off the video background? I, I think I lost it here. It's on the video. On the video submenu. Submenu video settings. Or okay. choo you can choose a virtual background. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, that should help a lot. You can see the mess that I live in here. Anyway, um, so the uh, data engine adapter is finished. 
And uh, thanks, Tom, for your input. We did manage to get all the traces to, to under uh, 15 millimeters and delta length. So that will help keep the, the skew down to, I think uh, it was about uh, 80 picoseconds between the minimum and the maximum uh, time delay on the data lines. And um, also the uh, loopback boards, uh, all of the uh, layouts, all, all the placements are done and uh, working on the routing of those right now. So, uh, and we, but on the data engine adapter, we have all the parts purchased. So uh, no more, um, gee, I can't get that part problem for, on that board. So uh, that should be, been, I, I don't think I'm gonna get them in time for handvention. I'll maybe get the blank boards in time, but, uh, and uh, during the regular session here, I'll put, put up the layout, and let you see what it looks like. Um, what else, what else? I think that's about it for right now. So back to you, Dave. Okay. Uh, oh, hold hey Dave. Yes. Just wanted to show you, this is a clock module. Oh. A real manufactured one with the GPS right here. You can, I don't know how Very close good. I can get and have it actually come across as. It's just a little farther fuzzy back there. is better because it's in focus. Close is out of focus. Looks like you oh. got a U, U blocks on there. Yeah. And I mean, this is only 40 millimeters across. Yeah pretty much square. And this is actually a cutout for the leaf board when it mounts on the uh, uh, tangerine because it had a little bit of a clearance issue. And right up here is the USB connectors on the data engine. So we couldn't go any higher here. This connector down here was at the bottom of the board as far down as we could go. And the FPGA is right, heat right next to it here. So it's kind of constrained. So it is kind of microscopic. And then the RF module, you can see that. Nice. With the connector, 140 pin connector over here on the back. Re these are the relays to select the attenuators and the noise source. And you can see there's along the bottom, top, and in the middle, there are uh, uh, lands for a metal shield, just in case you need to use that. We haven't put them on. We don't, I don't have any yet. They have to be custom made to fit, but they're there just in case we find that we need them. Excellent. So you, you can make a real, real quick prototype if you use that copper tape. I've done that. It works well. How, so you just put copper tape over the top and stick it down to the traces? You can actually make a, a cardboard form, put the tape over it, and solder the edges. Oh, okay. That's, I've good. done that. It works well. So it's a good way to test it to see if you need it and if it's really going to help yep. or not. Yep. So is that different than a steel shield? Because a steel shield... Uh, uh, if your immune metal shield will help magnetic pick up. Yeah, also. If you put copper down, it's only electrostatic. It's not right. magnetic. There's okay. no need for magnetic shielding on that. I wouldn't think so. You don't have currents high enough level to really cause any trouble. At any rate, what you can see here is see these, I don't know if these headers come through. There's one on the bottom, one on the top, and there's two connectors right here. That's for the optional um, little teeny, you decide what you want to put on it module. Mm. Uh, filter kind of thing. And then this is the low pass filter here, this guy. And the, um, you know, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the big header, Tom, do you remember what the big header is over here? Yeah, that allows you to provide power to that plug on module. If you, you just it, use the triple. two. Right, you so use all three connectors then? Yeah, if you use just the two um, towards the relays, it's all passive. And then the one over on the right gives you power and ground if you need it for a preamp or something. It also has a pin if you want to tie the ground of the system to the ground of the receiver, you can optionally strap that on and off. Right. And there's actually uh, these headers down here. Oh, up here okay. Do the same thing for without having to plug a board in here. Okay. Very good. Very good. So there you go. Excellent. You first, nobody else has seen it yet. Except I got my thing. hands out. I'm trying to grab it. That's great, Scotty. That's I really good. Tom was checking it out very carefully as you were holding <laughs> it up. <laughs> yeah. So, and that means that once you, um, you have all the parts for the adapter board, you said. So once that comes in, you build that. We can actually build a working system. By the end of the month, we should have working systems with the with the off the shelf boards. Wow. Yeah. Well, 
working systems without FPGA code or software. Well, <laughs> hardware working to blink a LED to start with, and then we'll get to busy on the rest. But this is the, uh, and, oh, I, I forgot to mention too that uh, I've been working with John Ackerman on the, and, and Tom on the clock module. And I've got the schematic for that about 90% done. We're still uh, figuring out what connectors we're going to use and uh, you know what's going to come out to the outside world and what's going to be strapped inside. But it's the uh, majority of it is done. And so that'll be really the last board that we have scheduled in the Tangerine system, except for the data engine that will be built as soon as we get the FPGAs. Wait, I thought you had the clock module there. Uh, it's the clock module carrier board that this oh. will plug into that will make it a lab type of instrument, brings all the outputs out to SMAs and, allow, and uh, has, brings the USB port out to a USB connector instead of to this little bitty connector down here. Yeah. So it's going to plug on just like it plugs on the data engine, but then you get okay. all the IOs and you can-, you can Right, right. Cool yeah, the carrier board makes it available yes. for the time nuts. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's right. That's great. I did tell our- um, NSF program officer today that we had a delivery date for the uh, Max 10s. So, all right. <laughs> he was happy. I mean, so, I sure hope it comes through. So, are you still okay with a, a year extension? Yeah, that will, that I think we need to do that because um, with a year extension, we'll actually get the prototypes built. We'll put the software on, get it tied in with Bill Angle Key system, and hopefully make some measurements and write yeah. some sort of a paper. So can I let Tom give his talk? <laughs> <laughs> okay, not much to say. Um, um, I looked at um, Scotty's data and drawings on the adapter board. And Scotty, I appreciate you're getting those traces equalized. My concern was that we already have some skew just on the receiver module and on the data engine. And when we put the um, adapter board between the dev kit and the receiver, um, you know, we might have even more skews. So minimizing that is good. Also, we have two connectors in the path now when we use the adapter board. And so minimizing skew gives a better chance that we can steer around any noise glitches due to the connectors or reflections. So really appreciate you uh, being able to rework that. That was great. And I spent a lot of time looking at John's data on the clock module, it looks pretty good. Uh, so I think uh, that's very promising. So back to the group. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the list. So unless I skip somebody, I asked Dave if he wanted to make a comment, but he's, Dave, is your mic working? No way nope. to tell. It oh, shows, now it is. It showed it was. Yes. Okay. Well, I, nothing really to say, however. Um, <laughs> so so uh, nothing really of interest to this group. Uh, but, uh, and my hair is not really green, but um, um, <laughs> I've been thinking about it, but green. I thought, uh, I thought it was for Easter. Well, yeah. yeah St. Uh, Patrick's Day is pretty close, isn't it? I don't know. He looks like a Billy Ellis fan to me. I, don't know. <laughs> I missed all that. But, but um, no, in fact, my shirt's quite green, but my hair is more green than that. <laughs> Anyhow. So um, you wear a red shirt? Is your hair red then? Maybe. I just, my light's real dim here. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's, that. I've been doing the other kinds of things people do. Uh, lately, like taxes and whatnot. Okay, well, uh, we're open for general discussion. I guess I also forgot to mention that before Bob let the smoke out of the regulator, he had the magnetometer interface working with Dave's code, and we were reading the remote magnetometer and temperature and the local temperature and all that stuff was working. So. So that's with a with all the Raspberry Pi, all the great boards plugged on. Everything works together. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, yep. 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 Do we Mine. have a standard format yet for the file up? Because we're starting that now, and um, you looks like you're doing some manipulation of the X Y Z data. And I'm not. Do we really want to save all that in the raw data file, or, or what's what's the direction we're heading on that? 
um, that was just for the for the interim, uh, okay. and there was no and uh, I, no one except maybe Dave and I, and maybe Dave also in Ohio. We haven't really done a lot of discussion of that. Okay, because I proposed that, that I was going to put the timestamp in the local temperature, the remote temperature, and then the XYZ readings and nanoteslas per second in the file. And I didn't think we wanted to do any more processing, but we can. But then it's it, that thought that the general thought was to just put the raw data in. If we want to do any processing, we'll do it external to the to the saved files. That's that's all I. In fact, I wouldn't even put the local temperature in there because um, for when some of these may not have it, and at least on my setups, um, it just mostly reads the temperature of the Raspberry Pi CPU because it's the local temperature is just hanging over the. Uh, but the well, on mine, the temp sensor is right next to the U-Blocks receiver, so it will track what the U-Blocks is doing, which I think yeah. is important. No, that's that sounds good. Yeah, it's so. just the final design did not end up the way I expected it to, <laughs> so. and um, it made no sense to. In fact, my own magnetometer has stopped working for reasons as yet to be determined. Uh, don't know quite at least my don't know what's happened, but uh, needs some investigation. The only I, thing I might suggest is that for you know for data format that sounds good, but in terms of that one second data, we probably need to agree on uh, cycle count and averaging mode for yes. that, so that everybody's doing the same thing. And when you do any post processing, you pretty much get the same results. Yeah, I will definitely be talking to you before because we just got it to talk and we haven't said anything up yet. And we're still uh, working on basic system communications right. and functionality. But yeah. once we get to that point, we will be in deep discussion with you about that. <laughs> I would yeah. also suggest that Yeoman Kim checks in on this. Yes, yeah, definitely. Because he's the one that's been using the data the most. Right. The, the only derived value that we recorded at all is the um, is the uh, uh, what you call it the, the overall vector overall vector yeah. yeah and I just put it there because I could it was you know yeah and it's helpful but yeah it, it's not at all necessary for for okay. anything that's sort mm -hmm. of what I thought but I wanted to confirm that that I didn't know if that was required for the digital RF format or what's involved with that and. I don't know. I don't know anything about the digital. Yeah, I'll probably format. be talking with Bill about that and figure out if we can, because I still don't know if I can do three channels live streaming at 8K data sample and save it yet with the Pi. So it's it's still we still have some mountains to climb over. So John, uh, I had to take care of something, but I, I heard the digital RF in the background, so I hopped back in. <laughs> Your ears are burning. So John, are you using the local temperature sensor on the um, magnetometer or only the remote one? Both. You, you mentioned that you were using it to detect the temperature of the GPS. Yeah, I put a, a uh, 9808 on the board right next to the GPS module. Oh, so you've got your own temperature sensor. I have my own temperature sensor and then it goes out on the bus and you read the remote one and the magnetometer data. And it works a whole lot better when you take the jumpers off the board. <laughs> Yay! I just want to make sure because we we are likely to uh, not have the local temperature sensor on the local end anymore. Okay, because I can take that off. I just no, saw no, no, no. don't there, take it but... off. I I can't get them anymore. They're on they're on back order forever. So we got the ninety eight oh fours, but I can only get enough to do. I can only get four hundred of them. So we bought four hundred of them. But if I build 500 boards, I, I'm 100 short. Right. So we're talking about leaving them off 250 of the boards. And because we're already making the local end different than the, than the remote end, because we're going to leave the um, PNI headers off of the local end, which will make it easier to solder the 40 pin connector in because they're not in the way anymore. And besides, they cost a dollar each and you don't need them. Right. So we're going to lose those, and then we're going to lose the temperature sensor on the local board also. 
because I just can't get enough of them. But if you're using it, then I will make sure that they're there. But if you're not using it, I'll delete it. We were planning on using it, but again, if, if the group says we don't need it, but I, I thought tracking the U-blocks temperature would be something useful. Okay, well, you will have it on the remote end anyway. So yeah, you'll be able to track right. the temperature in the ground. Yeah. You just won't be able to track it locally. Yeah, you'll be not tracking not. the temperature coefficient of the ferrites in the RM3100. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but you're, you said you've got one on your GPS board anyway. Yes. So, so have you been able to buy them? I bought enough to make the run that I did, but I don't have, you know, haven't bought two or 300 of them or whatever yeah, I, I think need. They're, they're back ordered to like October or something. So it might not affect you if you're not. But it probably won't affect me yet. Yeah. Because I'm not making a massive run. I have to talk with Nathaniel when we get together yeah. dating about what's going ahead here. So because I'm if, if there's important to keep it on the board, I'm willing to cut the run down to 400 and just make 400 if that if it's useful. But if you're going to have one on your board already and you're going to be using it to track the GPS temperature, I mean, is there a reason why you need to do that? I just thought it would be helpful for keeping track of if things start drifting, we can look at the temperature of the GPS module itself. Okay, and the have, Raspberry Pi doesn't have an onboard temperature sensor, right? No, no, it doesn't. Okay. No, we don't need one on the remote board though itself because your GPS module has, or your, your, your module has one. Well, you need the one on the remote board to measure the magnetic. Oh, no, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean the remote, I meant the local board. We really don't need it on the local board because you already have one to check the U blocks temperature, right? Well, that's what I put on the local board was another 9808. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's at address 20, and then the other one on the remote boards at 23. Right. But that what I'm saying is that that one on the remote board isn't needed because you have one. No, you do need it because the two the two locations are completely different. The magnetometer is underground at it. No, you know, right. No, no, no. I, I guess I guess I'm not making myself clear. The, yeah. the local board, which has the GPS unit, the U blocks, uh, you've got your own sensor on that. So we don't need what's on the Magpie hat board locally, only the remote one. Correct. You're right. That's yes. That's, okay. Now I understand. He's, he's, not, yes. use, he's not using a, a, a hat board. Yeah. I made my own connector. Right. Well, all, right. So all so I'm saying is. Right. All I'm saying is that we don't need the local board to have a sensor for, for our the purposes. Raspberry Pi version, correct. And but your board has its own sensor, and therefore, you know, we really don't need to address that on the local version of the, of the Pi Hat board. So, right. John, you're, did you make your own version of the local board for the yes. magnetometer? Yes. Okay, so you're not using our board anyway. No. So that's why you can get away with this, because our address is Azure's 22, I believe. 220 for the temperature sensor. And if you put that on your U blocks board and it's at 20 and you're on the same port, then we're going to have trouble. Well, actually, they showed up different. No, the, board, the red board you gave me, the remote sensor I thought showed up at 23. Oh, no, remote's different. I'm talking about the local sensor. Okay, let me see if I can find this. Because I'm worried that the local sensor and your sensor on the U blocks board will. They're plugged onto the same onto the Raspberry Pi. They're going to be sharing that same port. So the board my, he, the board he had were at eighteen, nineteen, and twenty three. Okay, so maybe that's 20 that D Rev board. Okay. That's how it was showing up on there last whenever we talked about it. And so eighteen and nineteen won't conflict. That those are the the temperature sensors. And 23, anything 20 to, through 23 works fine as long as you set the software up right. So I guess the question is, how did you get that 9808 to address 20? Because Let me, I'm I, trying to find the, he didn't. The, the screenshot here. Well, on his local board, Dave, he says it's 20. Oh, His version of the local uh, the two blocks board, it's 20. And we share the same I2C bus. So No, no, his 20 is... Oh, I'd have to look at the emails. Yeah, let me see. I, I did a screenshot of the scan of the bus. I'm trying to find it. Of course, I can't find it when I need it. I, I have it, but. Oh, where did it go? 
Yeah, so we actually have, you're right, Dave, the sensor's 18 on the local board and 19 on the remote. That's the way it was in the beginning, yeah. That's still the way it is. Yeah, and the, and the magnetometer was originally at 20, which is the normal default, but... Right, we modified that to 22 and 23. Just 23. Well, because we do... We, you could oh. plug it on the local side if you wanted to. We don't recommend that. And, and in the new, in the production version, we'll be able to because I the didn't, detectors won't be there. Yeah, I didn't, I, I've never really thought about that much. Yeah. And, and I have it listed here on the schematic as test only. So you're really not supposed to do that. It's, it doesn't make much, much, yeah, sense. But this is what, what was, what was putting a jumper in there was on, on it. Yes, because I'm looking at the possible combinations of address for 9808 and it does not include 20 hex. No, no, it doesn't. But it does for the magnetometer. Um, in fact, that's the normal default. Yes, you're right. In yeah. the factory. But you designed it in as 23, which is the high uh, option. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can do this. This should show the map. 18, 19, and 23. Yeah, I think 18 was the local temp sensor, or 19 was the remote, or vice versa, and then 23 was the uh, magnetometer. Right, but that means 18, in this map, 18 is your sensor on the, Yes. That's yes. going to interfere with the, with the one on ours if you put Well, mine it. has, I Why? have the jumpers on the board to be able to change that, so it's not a problem. Okay. I can put it anywhere I want. Well, why would that interfere? Well, if we leave it off, it won't. Yeah, but, yeah. But the okay. prototypes, it will. Okay, well, it's it was working. Yeah. This is actually yet another argument to leave it off because that way you can put yours on 18 and it won't make any difference. Yeah, I never understood why we changed any of them at all, but... <laughs> well, it's uh, interesting. The reason it was changed, Dave, was to make uh, the options available for jewels to to strap multiple ones together we had to make it a little bit different so that he could we could add straps for the remote modules and you could hook two or three of them onto the same i2c bus and have uh, them at uh, have them at like 23 21 and 20. Well, mine had straps yeah but, but yeah anyway if you look at the schematic it's got a table that shows the addresses and the uh the address line straps so, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, so. Julie, let's see if I can do this again. We're just making this all very complicated, I think. Well, I think the explanation is complicated, <sighs> but in the, in the end, it's not hard to, it's just that if you get two on the same address, it's not going to be so pleasant. Let's see if this shares correctly. No. Why does it keep jumping? <coughs> Give me a moment. This computer is not being nice. Nathaniel, do you need to do something to allow him to share? No, i am got the wrong screen showing up. It's my fault. Yeah, everything should be good. Let's try it now. No. Really? <laughs> Why is this being so persnickety? Oh, there it is. That's the problem. All right. Give it one last college try here. There. So as you can see, I have here, I have jumpers on the board and that are set to default to 18, but I can set them anywhere in this range. 18 is ideal. So that's where the, my onboard temp sensor is showing up. Is that, if you put 18 on there, it won't work with our sensor. Okay, because well, here- you're Using your own. Why? Why, we're not going to do a local. So actually this turns out right because it, it, at some point, no, no, if you've got your own um, um, 
I could see their face like I see you have. You aren't yeah. even using ours on the on the local. Yeah, app. he's not using our local board at all. So make it look just like our logo board at 18. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's I what he's it. doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm slow here. I was trying to remember what you did so I didn't screw you up. No, I think it I think it I think you got it right. Okay. And the last thing I wanted to ask Scotty, if you could send me the pin map for the GPIO connector. I haven't been able to put my finger on it because I made a couple of mods to it. I've added a few. Oh, really? Okay. Um, this is my new sequencing engine. Oh my God. Yeah. One CPLD would do all that, you know, John. I know. And I would have done it in an FPGA. No, you can use I... CPLD. Yeah. Easy well, one. But there's only like five flip flops on this, right? Yeah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. So you what do you need now? You need the, <clears throat> the Raspberry Pi pinout? The pin map that you we had agreed on what pin sharing was going to be for the GPIO header. I just haven't been able to find it on my Mac anywhere. I, I know I have a copy of it because we had agreed on it and I sent it to you. Yeah. If you could just email it to me, I'll, I'll fill it out and we'll, because I had to add a, uh, a handshake line. Well, I, did I, I sent you back an Excel spreadsheet with my stuff on it too, right? Yes. Now I'll have to find that. Good luck with that. <laughs> okay, you're in the same boat I'm in. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I lose stuff all the time, and I, I think I'm pretty organized, but apparently I'm not. So. <laughs> Everything's relative. Yeah. So wait a minute here. Let's see. Uh, well, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, I don't it's not a crisis, but I want to keep in sync with you so I, we don't lose yeah lock step on that yeah. well and and when we went to the rev e we simplified it a lot so i think i need to edit that because there's a couple okay i took off like the two interrupt lines we don't use anymore right so i don't need to put them on there and i've got a data ready a data yeah we don't use received data and i've actually got an a to d error bit so i've added three bits yeah and if i mean hopefully you pick the ones we didn't use because we don't use a lot of it. We use the two I2C pins, and then we use one I.O. pin that does the enable on the, uh, the PCA20, whatever, the, the right. I2C transceiver, and that's it. And power and ground, that's all we look, hook up to. So, Well, I sent you a copy of the schematic that I just made. Um, okay. But I want to be, I'll take the, the effort to get that straightened out, and we'll work it out. Like I say, I want to stay in sync with you. I don't want to screw this up. Yeah, let's see. I was going to. Okay. So I was going to go back to show the um, um, data engine adapter. If we're done with the. the uh... Make us all drool. This is moving pretty fast, so this is not going to take very long. Now that we got all the parts, I don't have to screw around with uh, what can I buy. I just had a customer come in and they fiddled around and didn't buy the parts that I told them to back in January, and now they got shortages and they want me to fix it for them. And they got this. No kidding, this is a, a 100 microfarad 1210 capacitor. I can only find one source and one vendor for that specific physical size. And they have to buy a reel. Ooh. They're a buck sixty each. Cha ching. Sixteen hundred bucks they gotta buy. Now to be fair, they got they need three hundred and fifty of them anyway. But they gotta buy a full reel to get it for the third of a reel that they need. So it's gonna cost them an extra grand because they screwed around and it's like, hey, you know, I'll help you as best I can, but I can't make parts up out of nothing. Are if these they're ceramics? Fair, they're ceramics, yeah. They're X5Rs, but okay. they're hundred microfarad. Wow. So that's, it's the largest size, the most capacitors you can get in that size package. It's a 1210. And I can find tons of 47s and 22s and the smaller ones. No 100s. Yeah, that's true. It's probably only 6.3 volts, too. It's, it's 16 volts. Oh, 16. Wow. Yeah, it has to be because it hooks on a 12 volt bus. So, oh, okay. And, Howdy. Um, let me change the subject here real quickly. What okay. power supply are we going to need for testing the data, the adapter, the receiver, the clock, all that stuff? The power supply that comes with the board. Okay. okay. 
because it's going to supply uh, 12 volts, which is the power supply. Okay. And three volts. It's got regulators on it for three volts. And then we actually regulate the 12 down to five and 1.8 on the data, ad data engine adapter. Okay. So we just need a 12 volt supply. Right. And actually, let, let me share my screen because I want to make another comment on that. Um, okay. So this is the um, adapter. Everybody, can you see that? Mm hmm. Let me make it a little bit bigger, maybe. That seems all right. So over here on the right, these two, these are the two mounting holes, and this is the uh, MICTOR connector for the uh, TI uh, quad channel A to D board that John's using for the VLF module. So it will plug in here, and it will hang off both sides of the board here because it's big. And we don't really need to make the baseboard any bigger. We got enough room for the connector. So it's going to be out to here, maybe, and up to here. And, and it'll run right down the middle here and across. Then down here, the clock module goes facing downward. This is the mounting hole, and this is the connector for the clock module. So it's going to right. plug into this connector and, and go down here. And actually, the corner of the module, the cutout, actually accommodates that mounting hole for the adapter right so it plugs in here and wow. then and then underneath this is the 140 pin connector on the back side the rf module plugs in and the and the smas stick out up here right and the hmac connectors on the back side and the uh hsmc is back i'm here. sorry hsmc right and yeah. in fact i don't understand why there's only one hole here or there's one below it. Uh, oh, that's right. So it is, it is. Okay, let's do this. So there, this is a composite of all the layers. Got it. So the HSMC three section connector right here. Right. This is the 140 pin. And you can see where he zigzagged them to make them all within 15 millimeters of each other. Right, right. So all these are the data traces from the A to D that come up to the HSMC connector. And then okay. this is these are just general purpose jumpers to say that you can read. Yeah. And uh, I actually got extravagant here. I put this uh, OLED display on here because I figure if we're going to have, um, we're going to use this for demos, we might want to have something fancy looking and we can either, you can plug it on or not plug it on either way you want to do it. It's, nice. uh, it's about does eight bucks. Does the OLED display plug on from the other side? Uh, no, it goes on the top here. This uh, is the component side. The RF module goes on the back side, so it doesn't block it. And the RF module goes back to back, so all the points, test points, and all that on the RF module, turn the whole assembly over, and you can get at everything on the RF module. Okay, so the see, my understanding was the um, HSMC, HSMC connector. Right. Is that on this side of the board or the other no, side of the board? No, it's on the back. And so you plug it on, and so the the off the shelf uh, FPGA board will be it will cover about uh, from about here down to here and off the edge, and the and the. Um, dual are we looking down here? Are we looking at the side of the board with the HSMC connector on it, no, or are we looking, looking at, at the either. other side? You're looking at an X-ray view of all the layers. Yeah, we're okay, at the top layer, looking down. So. Okay. It's hard to see what's on top. If you want to look at the bottom assembly, that they flip it over, and this is the back now. And with the okay, I got on. it. And this is the only part that's on the back, which is irritating because I'm going to have to have a space for a stencil for one part. Sure. But that's the way. And then yeah, well, it's to, got a lot of leads. <laughs> it's got a lot of leads. Yeah. So okay. there, and here is the secondary side, X-ray view. Yeah. So if you want to see, there's there's the connector there. And then the primary side is here. And you can see that connector is a surface mount. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on the top of it. Right. Have you estimated how much current the 12 volt supply is going to need to, su to supply for uh, everything? Yes, I did. I, uh, I, I put it down on the schematic and I think okay. we're gonna end up with, I forget how much it is, but I, I figured out how much the clock module draws, how much the TI board draws, and how much the RF module draws, and I added it all up, and I think we're okay on the 12 volts, mainly because it's supplied by an external power 
so 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 we don't re they don't regulate it and we don't regulate it so at the worst case we might have to replace their wall wart supply with a little beefier one if we need more 12 volts <laughs> does it require exponential notation <laughs> yeah no i mean because i mean the amount of power that we consume is very small yeah. relative to the power of the fpga that, that it okay needs. i'm still trying to understand the power supply is it something we have to go out and buy no, the power supply is a wall wart that comes in the kit. Okay, of uh, which kit? Power supply in, in the off-the-shelf FPGA box, there is okay. a wall wart power supply. That's like okay, so it's, it's the power supply that comes with the dev kit? Correct. Okay, thank you. And if that isn't sufficient, in the worst case, we just have to replace that supply with one with a little bit more power. But yeah, I, it's, a, it's supplied with 12, uh, 1202 amp and should be easy enough to find something bigger than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I bought from DigiKey. Yeah, I think the they have a 12 volt 3 amp. Really looks like it's a standard 5.5, 2.1 connector. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I can I can go back here and show you this, this to you. But the, uh, OK, the RFM connector I've got here, 10 milliamps, 180, 300, 400 milliamps. So, the, and these, the five volts is supplied. We have an onboard five volt, two amp regulator. There's a switcher. Okay. And all the other regulators come off of that five volts, except for the three volts comes off directly off of the board, off the FPGA board because it has a 3.3 volt regulator, but we only use a couple hundred milliamps. So, so what, is, what does that all translate back to the 12 volt? Okay, so the, the five volt at 400 milliamps is going to end up being about 150 milliamps at 12 volts out of the switcher. Right. Mm -hmm. Other ones translate straight across because they're linears. So uh, current's current. But notice that 10 milliamps here, 10 milliamps, I'm using only 10 milliamps of the 12 volts. So the five and the three are the big users of the RF yeah. core. If it's so 120. So you're we're like talking a, maybe 350 milliamps. Yeah. Right. The 3.3 three three is a linear from 12 or from the 5? 3.3 three three is provided by the uh, FPGA board, a regulator on board it, and I, it's a switcher off the 12 volts. Ah. I don't have a 3. three well, actually, I'll show you what I have. It's easy enough. So we hit 12 volts in, we generate 5 out. We take five volts down to VDDIO, which is, this is only like 10 milliamps or something. And then we have a 2.5 volt regulator off of the five volts also. And this, this is what the regulators are rated at. This is not what our consumption is. Mm. So we got a couple of 300 milliamp regulators for like 20 milliamps of current. Okay, and then I have a separate regulator for the display. And this is weird. I have a three volt regulator for the display, two two point eight volt regulator for the display, because it's uh, designed to run on three volts, and we could run it on three point three. But if we run it on two point eight, then all these FPGA pins, which are hardwired on the development board to two and a half volts, I have to put level translators on them. So yeah. if they run, if they're two and a half, and I run this guy two point eight, which is within spec, I don't have to do any level translation. So that's a no brainer because, because this was just an a, uh, OG, let's try an option. I don't really care much if it doesn't work because I haven't lost anything. It's just that it's got a better odds if you kind of fiddle around with the voltages a bit. Because yeah, this will run is like 2.5 to 3.3 with 3.0 recommended, but 2.8 will work. So, okay, you should be golden. So, anyway, back to the clock module connector. The clock module uses 3.3 at 280 milliamps. So now we're talking about a 500 mils or so at 3.3. And that's, that burdens on the uh, off the shelf board. Mm. The five volts here is on my 200, my two amp regulator off of the 12 volts. So this again will be about 150 mils at 12, same as this one over here. So about 300 mils additional 12 volt current. And again, no 12 volt uses it here, but so the 3.3 is really the place that we ought to watch it. And that's about what, uh, 450 milliamps, the 3.3. Mm -hmm. And that's gotta be provided by the off the shelf board. And the MICTOR connector 
this is what I'm allocating for the for the uh, TI board, very little. It does not consume much current. It's basically the one quad chip and analog inputs. So it's it, not much. And uh, the display draws, I think, eight mils, something like that. So nothing. So really, the two biggies are these two right here. Okay. So the, uh, do you know how much current the development board consumes? No, I don't. Okay. Like Dave says, we get a 12 volt, 200 amp. I mean, a two amp regulator. <laughs> I need it. I wish it had 200 amp regulator. Anyway, I just go get a car battery and forget about it. Yeah, that's right. I hope you arc welder. Hope you don't short anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the story, and we'll uh, give it our best power shot here and see what happens. Because, uh, and then what? One of the things that I did is if you see down here, these two headers, they're okay. 3.3 volts in and 12 in. This is exactly the same power pins that the HSMC connector provides. This is so that John can plug a clock module on here and use this board as a clock module development board without having an FPGA board. Okay. So you don't need to plug anything in over here. You can supply power to it here. And there's a USB, a vertical USB right here that connects to the clock module. So this goes to the uh, synthesizer. So synthesizer and the GPS. So you can program them with a PC and mm -hmm. play around with it and do anything you want without having an RF board or, or an FPGA board or anything. And until we have the carrier board, which yeah. may not be very much longer anyway, this will be the way to te per test the first articles of the clock module. Okay. See if you can set the one of the outputs, and I believe if I look, I don't remember what it. Well, actually, on the clock module itself, there is a reference output. TP one yep. and TP two come out to the reference output, so you'll be able to program that and see if it worked. And so, do right. not pull TP one low on boot because the baud rate goes to eight k baud. <laughs> yes. Well, you know. If you plan to use the clock module, you must plan to be cognizant of what the chips do. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't do my homework on that one and I sounds like, me. Sounds like you found out the hard way. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and then up here, if you can see this I2C1 and I2C0, these are actually the I2C ports. Actually, I take that back. This USB goes to the GPS. Right, mm. there's I, I2C to the synthesizer. I2Cs go to the synthesizer. And to the, um, 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 it's because there's something else. It goes to two places. I guess maybe it goes to the GPS also, but uh, John says everything can be done to the GPS over the USB port. That so is you don't correct. need the I2Cs for that. Is that right, John? Yes. And then, but you're going to need one of these I2C ports to talk to the uh, synthesizer. So Great. you're going to have to have an I2C to serial port translator and plug it on those those these headers right here. So the idea is you can use this board standalone to program the clock module. Now, unfortunately, you don't get all the clock module outputs. There's 10 outputs. And, and I think we bring, yeah, in fact, if you see this right here, this ref clock, this is like output nine of the zero to nine, so the 10th output. And this has the same circuit that we're going to use on the adapter board, on the carrier board. So you get one output that you can play with. But if you can program one output, you can program all of them. So if you can make that one do what you want, then you're talking to the part. So that's kind of where we're headed for that. What connector do you have there? Pardon me? Is that a, what connector do you have there for J2? For J10? J2, J2. the ref clock out. J2, that is a uh, MMCX, I believe. Oh, the little tiny one. Little okay. tiny snap on guy. Yeah. Is it a U.FL? Yeah, it's a U.FL. You're right. So, what you're going to do is you're going to go to eBay and buy a cable, UFL to SMA, and you're going to plug it yeah. on there. And you yeah. got about three insertions before they break. Yeah. Well, you should so put it on there and do all the rest at the other end. Yeah. After you super glue it down, you won't need to take it <laughs> off anymore. Yeah. I've got those. Oh, one thought I had uh, I'll bet you didn't think to put any. Uh, uh, backwards diodes on the 3.3 and the 12, given you've got those connectors there that are unkeyed. 
Uh, no. Now, wait a minute. The um, Hold on a second. Somebody's going to hook those up wrong. Well, you know what? John's buddy let the smoke out of his regulators. So <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Actually, he didn't put power on backwards. He just had too much inductance on the cable. He switched something he wasn't supposed to. And I forgot to tell him not to do that. So that's on me. <laughs> uh okay so you have a switcher i don't know what happens if you hook the 12 volts up backwards to this right on the one i'm using for about 300 milliseconds it emits a flame about 12 to 15 centimeters high cool and it's really really cool to watch until so, you have to fix it <laughs> i see this is not theoretical no. <laughs> yeah, and the 3.3 volts, if you look at it backwards, you're screwed because yep. it, it goes to the GPSs and it goes to every other place. It's it's right. an internal 3.3, so, so you're out of luck. So don't do that. Don't, don't do, do that. that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so awesome. hard to put the smoke oh, back in. And, and you notice that there is plus and minus marked right on the silk screen. Right, that so works. If you, if you do it, you get the DeSoti Award. <laughs> Dumb shit of the year. Connect it up backwards because I I made it hard for you to make the mistake, but I can't prevent stupid. So or careless, yeah. more likely. Yep. What that they actually gave us a round pin and a square pin. Yeah, square is pin one, so that's it. Yeah. Now, if I'd been smart, I would have used ramp connectors that are polarized, but I'm not that smart. So that by the way, these only got put on here like two days ago. Much to the annoyance of the CAD guy. Uh, those are tenth gone. inch, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah actually, easy. there are some. There are some uh, polarized tenth inch that you could put there. Yeah. Other, yeah, you could, except they're pretty close together, so the ramps might not work. But if you put a jumper on here, you could burn up the uh, power supply on the uh, development board. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> There's lots of things you can do to kill yourself. So. Do not stick head in oven with gas on. We should put that on the <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so uh, let's see. Anything else of uh, import that I can think of? The, so the switching power supply is right here in the center. And the linear supplies are right down here. And this VDDIO jumper is for you to be able to select 1.8, 2.5, or 3.3 out of the, regu the linear regulator for VDDIO. Now, normally we were going to select 2.5 because that's what the, the uh, data engine is going to supply. But, and interestingly enough, on the, I don't have the layouts yet of the uh, loopback boards, but the loopback boards are going to basically, they're going to be same form factor as an RF module, clock module, and leaf module. And they're going to plug on to the data engine in those slots, slots, and then they're they just loop the signals back. But what I had to do was I had to check every ground and power pin separately, because the purpose of the loopback board is to test for manufacturing defects like bad solder joints. So that means there's not really a ground. There's a separate LED for every ground point. And in fact, I, I do have a preview here I can show you. It's, it's kind of interesting because the first thing my CAD guy says when I send him the drawing, this board doesn't have a ground. <laughs> and I go, um, you're right. <laughs> so uh, let's see, here it is. If I can get it over to the other. Okay, we'll just take the whole damn thing. So this is the RF module loop back. What you don't see is the 140 pin connector on the back side here. And then these are all LEDs. Separate LED for each ground pin, separate one for 12 volt power. And then what I did is for VDDIO, I have comparators and they tell you what voltage, the name of what light lights up, it tells you what voltage the VDDIO is. Mm. So you can see by changing the jumper, if it actually changes the VDDIO or not. Cool. And then we did the same thing on the clock module. The, uh, let's see, hold on a second here.
it's interesting is the title of it was clock module preliminary placement and he shows me the rf module so One second here, as soon as I, the, so many of these have been going by, it's hard to. Uh... Yeah, okay, here's the other one. This is the, remember, this is only 40 millimeters across. So, wow. So, but there's three VCCIOs that can be strapped differently on the data engine. So, there's three sets of comparators with three LEDs for each, one for each voltage. And I made them blue, green, and red. So we have, you know, no more boring all green boards. They Hooray. different colors. And all these are green down here, but these are this is a preliminary one. We've grouped the fives and the threes and the grounds together and let, and I added some space in between mm -hmm. and moved the logos and things around so it, it fits a little differently. <clears throat> but basically the same idea. And then if you look at the rat's nest which I think is uh, only one attachment, sorry. So I don't have the rat's nest for this one, but it's, it's giving him heartburn because he's gonna be able to make these two layer boards mm -hmm. because the, the none of the traces are, are controlled impedance. There's no uh, more um, differential pairs. There's no more high speed, anything. This is all DC slow speed levels. We're just checking for continuity. So what we're going to do is apply patterns to the outputs and look at the inputs and see if they come back and then invert them or, or shift them and see if they follow. And the idea is to make sure that the connectors are all soldered down and we got a full path back to the FPGA for every line down here that's supposed to be back to the FPGA. Very and, nice. And I think I can do one more here. We got the leaf board. The leaf board was interesting because we, while we've built a clock module, and we've built an RF module. We haven't built a leaf module yet. So there's there was no sample board to start with. So let's see. Uh, no, I don't have that. I don't think I'm going to have uh, the leaf module. I've got lots of uh, questions on the leaf module, <laughs> like no ground, where's the ground source? But I don't have a leaf uh, um, rat's nest yet. So I can't. Um, at least for the VLF module, um, the TI eval board is um, pretty much the circuit I had planned on going with. Right, and that's the idea. Well, you're going to have to have a different connector for a real leaf board. Right, yeah. And you're going to have a different physical form factor. So that's, we had not, since we hadn't built the VLF board yet, we, we have the tentative size of the leaf board that we made up when we built the data engine. Something yeah. that would mate with the data engine properly, which is where we got the cutout on the clock module, by the way. So we have kind of a, yeah, it's got to be about this size, but we had to make sure to go and size it so that it will fit on the data engine and be a real size that we can use. And so he did that. And that's where we came up with, uh, actually, we didn't come up with anything here on the loopback board. We came up with that because this is, this is for the TI adapter board, the one you're right. going to use, Jonathan, right? Yeah. So that'll enable you to uh, actually prototype the VLF module connected to an FPGA. Yep. And, and to the clock module, the same way it would be on the real data engine when we get it. Mm -hmm. And then when we get, when you figure everything out, we'll make a leaf board that will have the leaf connector on it and will fit onto the data engine. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that'll work great. So. Yeah, I'm looking for the, uh, I thought the leaf was the first one that he did, but apparently I am uh, mistaken. Well, 
Um, let me know when you want me to ship you the uh, eval board because I I, I uh, actually have it right here. And, okay. So are you using are you using it currently for something? Because I don't want to take it away from you. Can no. You? no. Yeah. No. 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 Right now, I'm I, I'm not using it. At it, it's it's actually better. It'd be better sent to you anyway, because at least you could do the mechanical fit and, and then just make sure everything fits right. Okay. Because uh, I have good. You know, I'm. I'm uh, uh, working with the sound card right now, so um, I could just send you send you the uh, beef board. Okay. Yeah, I know I was going to send you my address, but I'm not really ready for the board just yet. So. <laughs> okay. Well, whenever you're ready, let me know, and I will. Okay. I will check it out. And um, I don't remember how many jumpers we have on the data engine but this is supposed to this gives us a set of 10 jumpers to uh use for whatever we want to different configurations these are just io bits you can read because whenever i have extra ios i can't resist hooking them up to something mm. a good move because they always get used yeah scotty i got a question sure did you ever Mention what the OLED modules part number is or where you got it. Oh, no. Do you want to know that? It would be interesting. Uh, just a second. Uh, it, it, I believe it. You know what? I better not do it that way. I better do it. Okay, this is the bill of materials, and it would be uh, D, uh, DS probably. Yeah, here it is, right here. 1608 OAO. I'll paste it in the chat here. If I can ever find the chat window. There it is. Yeah. Well. But I su suggest that um, if you want to buy one, you're SOL because I bought all of them. <laughs> <laughs> they only had eight in stock, so not every board is going to get one. We're looking. Yeah. Nathaniel, I'm only going to build 15 of these. Is that okay? Yeah, because you said we only have like um, you know 12 of these adapters. We have we adapters. have 11, and then I yeah. figure a one or two extra for people who want to check clock modules out, maybe that don't need uh, boards. Uh huh. So 15 should be sufficient. It sounds good to me. And then I'm going to build five sets of uh, loopback boards. And those are going to be mostly for manufacturing. So, yeah, that, that sounds good to me. In fact, if I get them early enough, I can use them to, to debug the uh, display board. I mean, the data engine adapter board, because the two of the three connectors anyway are the same. I can't check out the uh, Victor connector for Jonathan, but I can check out the rest of them. But Jonathan can check that out by writing the six lines that he has to his board and make sure they work so very nice scotty so good jim, job thanks. so jim did you find that at digikey yeah it shows up as a oh excuse me as a marketplace product from orient um, yeah do they show any in stock uh no but it says ship in approximately one day oh okay i don't know if i could believe that but well, we already have ours so I'm, I'm but it's it's a 0.96 color it's 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 very small it's it's like what 96 pixels by 64 pixels or something it looks one, like it's 160, 160 by, by 80, 80 is what yeah. it says yeah so it's and it's what did you say a 0.9 inch right 0.96, it's 0.96 yeah so there are others out there but i'm not sure they're that cheap so 
So don't expect to be, you know, reading War and Peace on it or anything. <laughs> but it's SPI on the interface? It's a spy interface, so okay. it becomes a programming exercise to put something meaningful up on it. So we'll probably, first thing we'll do is we'll encode the ham side logo and put it up on there. Nice. There you so go. What, what color do you want, Nathaniel? Orange, of course, right? Tangerine. Absolutely Tangerine. orange. <laughs> All the solder masks are orange, just like this guy here. Which probably you can hardly tell that it's orange, but oh yeah, it's it's not really tangerine. It's not really orange, but it's not red or yellow either. So I'm good with it. And on the clock module, there's hardly any space to see the solder mask, so it's all covered with parts. So, and uh, John, did you see on the back here? We have space for the other GPS. Oh. So you can put either the F9T on the front like we did, uh -huh. or we have the, uh, what is it, the Neo series. Neo M8 T is the one I'm using, yeah. Well, we actually have, John uh, um, Ackerman has a couple of, of uh, Neo M8 Ts. Mm -hmm. So we built two of these of the 25 boards without GPSs on them. So he's going to solder those two on and we'll have, we'll be able to test with both the mid-grade, that's the mid-grade one, right? It has two outputs still. Right. But it's only one channel, right? One one uh, GPS channel. Correct. Okay, so, but it, since it has two outputs, you can still get one PPS at 10 megahertz. The very low-end $50 one, or maybe it's $15. $15 one, you only get one output. Right. So you can't get both PPS and 10 megahertz at the same time. So we'd have to recreate either of those if we wanted to use that low performance one, but it's very much cheaper. Yeah. So, but I think for space weather station, this is the one we're going to use because it's got, it's a dual band one. So mm. you can do TEC measurements with it. Very nice. So we actually are getting close to having something. Yay. Yay. <laughs> then the pressure's on for FPGA coding. That's right. Ooh. To actually make it do work. No, I, that's to me, that's way more fun than building hardware I can't build. Well, that hardware. is true. I mean, once you actually have something you can work with. It's like my buddy who uh, transitioned from hardware design to um, software. He said software is his own virtual reality which is why mm -hmm. he likes it. He's not dependent upon any chip makers or anybody. Once you get the board, you make You're it do good. whatever you want. Yep. Living in the matrix. And especially, <laughs> he likes being able to destroy hardware with software. That was his favorite thing. <laughs> Halt and catch fire. <laughs> but we were working on a, uh, a binding machine for this company who has mm -hmm. since gone away, but they could punch 100 sheets of paper at once. Wow. The only other competitor could punch, I think, 40 or 50 sheets. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to bind anything that was bigger than 40 sheets, you had to put them in multiple times to be punched and then mm -hmm. put collate them yourself and put them back in and put the binder on. But they make binders that'll bind, you know, 250 sheets. Mm -hmm. But you can't punch all those at once. So this thing, it had uh, an anvil and a die that they could they had this giant cam about that big and you could it was took so much force that you could only punch one hole at a time because of the size motor they had which is like a an eight horsepower motor it was a big honking motor like that big around and they they built a solid aluminum base solid aluminum plate two decker with the motor mounted in between and when the cam would go around and, and it would go chunk 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 and hit each hole one after the other, like, I don't know, 10 degrees apart, it would actually flex the bottom plate up because of the forces <laughs> on it. And so what happened is they, they had to mill the dies to like within 10 thousandths. And they were trying to have this make, made in China at the same time as they were designing it, which is a big mistake because the Chinese guys said, we can't mill anything that accurately with the equipment we have. So the guy in Tempe is in Scottsdale. He made prototypes parts for like 11 units. And there's like 12 punches for each unit. So he's making over a hundred pieces 
on the milling machine in the back room. <sighs> and I mean, talk about a mind numbing job on a CNC machine all day, a machine the size of your attic. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is that until they got this, the thickness of the material right, you would actually break cams and you, you don't stand in the way of them because it, one would shoot out and embed itself in the wall opposite yep. because of the you know, sharp piece would break off. <laughs> but the interesting thing was not that wasn't interesting to, to my friend, the programmer. The thing is, you have to move the paper in, punch the holes, move the paper out, open the comb, move the paper in, close the comb. Then move the paper out and raise it. It, it. it was all these these mechanical operations, all run by motors and gears. And the problem is, some of them interfered with each other. <laughs> so, in other words, you couldn't. You had to bring it out and up. You couldn't go up first as so you hit something. And and when you got the comb open, there are certain constraints that you, you where you couldn't move the paper, the bundle of paper. And, and if you and they didn't have it quite down right, so they'd instruct him to make his software do it this way. Here, here's the the prescribed algorithm you're supposed to follow. And you do that, and he ram things into each other and break things, because the motors all had plenty of torque to break things, because they were all geared down, so they would just just bend things and snap things off and rip wires out because they hadn't figured out all the little details. So and he loved that because what he did is he'd run his software and it would break something and then he'd get a break while they had to go fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't work out so well because they were so far behind because they kept trying to engineer it and manufacture it at the same time. It just never worked out. Yeah, it doesn't work. So, but it was a fun job while it lasted because we got to play with big, heavy iron. Anyway, oh, I should probably stop sharing here since we're done with that. So I don't know what, I, I'm open to suggestions for what we put on the OLED display other than the ham side. Maybe we can get a little slideshow going of uh, different logos or just, just maybe flip through the logos and they'll put an NSF logo up, put the ham side logo up, put the Tapper logo up, just cycle through them. <laughs> you can put the University of Scranton in there too. Yeah. Or, or put that uh, test pattern that Bill and Jelly has up on his. <laughs> you could, I don't um, think it's come out as we, good. Once we get a bar lap, pie lap working, you can put little ray trace diagrams up there too. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, or, or a little, you know, we can do little ionograms. So that means we're going to have to put one of these displays on the, not, I'm not changing the data engine now, but we do the part <laughs> two, I'll add to one of these displays so that we can run the same code and put the same kind of stuff up. <laughs> That'd be good. Um, I got a question, Scotty. I looked right. at the data sheet linked off of uh, DigiKey and it's got all the specs, but I don't see any programming information. Do you have any of that? Uh, you have to go, you have to look at the chip that they used for the controller and search for that and find the data sheet for it. Okay. And, and then it does the list the chip. Uh, 77 355 is that is that the brains yeah and uh i think i have you have to bit bang it yes it's not going to be fun yeah you're you're, you're working with an array of dots i should should have just put three colored leds on there and forget about it but you know never being one for simplistic it's like <laughs> wow an OLED display that'd be cool it's only eight bucks let's put one on there so that's what happened. <laughs> you have to be careful with OLEDs. If you leave them on too long in the same color, they'll burn. They also age out. Yeah. I have an SDR. I mean, not an SDR, but an internet radio I bought for my mom. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, it's a name brand radio too, like a Crane or something. And the OLED display has gone on it. Wow. And I, I Googled it online and they said there's um limited availability some of them are have the the controller connected up to the lcd elements backwards so when you put it in it shows up upside down <laughs> i'm going to um my student alex calderon just came on we're gonna alex and i are gonna jump to like breakout room one because we're gonna try and debug what uh it's, what's going on with the far left thing right now oh okay so you, guys, you guys can keep going but
Uh, I'm gonna uh, probably say seven threes myself. Yeah, here. I'm about I'm about burnout here too. So I got yeah. my taxes too. So I'll, I'll stop uh, the recording. <laughs>